Good morning, everyone. Today, we'll be sharing with you one of our lectionary passages from Psalm 22, a psalm that, that has just the full range of, of emotion uh, for David, uh, who's experiencing such grief and angst and feelings of being forsaken. And it goes from kind of the pit of despair to the heights of hope. And I think that's a timely message for us. So we'll read Psalm 22. We'll pop over to the New Testament in the book of Matthew. And then Joe and I come together to sing Great is Thy Faithfulness at the end of the song. Uh, so Psalm 22, let's just get right into it. David here in his own voice is saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, as we move into the New Testament, you know, these are the words that are on Jesus's lips. I want to understand those words a little better today because sometimes we apply Psalm 22 directly to Jesus without ever thinking about what they meant in David's own life. And I think in doing so, we, we miss the fullness of what it means when Jesus recites these words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why am I all alone? He's saying, where are you? Where are you when I cry for you? And don't we all know that same cry in our own hearts? Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. There's so much pain in me and everything is a mess and I'm crying out to you and I'm not getting an answer. Where are you, God? We know these words. These are, these are our words. These are David's words. These are also Jesus's words. My God, I cry out, cry out by day, but you don't answer me. By night, but I find no rest. Day and night, day and night, the anxiety, the worry, the pain, the struggle. David's experiencing it all, and he doesn't, he doesn't know where to find Jesus. He, well, he doesn't know where to find God in the midst of it. And I think for us, we don't always know where to find Jesus in the midst of our pain and our struggling. And I think these words are instructive for us. The Psalms have been the prayer book of, of Scripture for, for generations. It would have been the prayer book for Jesus, in fact. And I think that that's why when we see Jesus on the cross crying out these same words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is praying the Psalms and so should we. We must learn, I think, to, to allow the Psalms to become um, the root of our prayer life. So I cry out by day and by, by night, but I don't know where you're answering. I can't find any rest yet. Transition. <laughs> Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. So David is saying, I don't know what's, what you're doing for me and why you're not answering the way I want you to answer, but I know that you are God in heaven. I know that you are enthroned above. You are the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors have put their trust. They trusted you and you delivered them. So he's calling on the history of his people, on Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all those that have come before. And he says, these are our ancestors and you have been our God. You have covenanted with us to protect us and to deliver us. And you've done it time and time again. So, oh God, I'm not yet giving up hope. I think that's what David is saying here. I have not yet given up hope. I am in despair. My voice cries to you. I don't know how to find any rest. But I know that you are the God who is enthroned in heaven and you are the one who has rescued Israel time and again. So come and rescue me. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But another transition. So he's reciting the history and the, the, the interaction that God has had with his people through time. When he comes back to himself and he, I think, is saying, but what is my problem? What's the deal, God? <laughs> Why not for me? But I am a worm. I'm not a man. I'm scorned by everyone, despised by people. So I'm crying to you day and night, but I'm still less than, less than human in most people's sight. I am, I am considered a worm and everyone scorns me and people despise me. People mock me. They hurl insults. They shake their heads at me. He says that he trusts in the Lord, they say. Oh, I'll let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Kind of just mocking. Oh, he, is he really God's? 
yet. Here we go. This is prayer, man, where, where we recite truth and we speak what we know God has said to us. And then we also cry out what's in our souls and where the depths of our pain is and where we're like, God, this doesn't match up. I don't yet see you doing anything for me. What are you going to do about it? Kind of that personal interactive uh, wrestling with God. Yet, you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast, like from the time I was an infant, when I was still nursing. <laughs> you made me to trust in you. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. David's saying, I have been faithful from birth to you. You are all the only God that I know and the only God that I worship. And so he says in verse 11, Do not be far from me. For trouble is near, and there is no one to help. David's like, I, I don't serve idols. You know, I'm not, looking, <laughs> I'm not looking around for help anywhere else. It's to you that I am crying, so come to me. There is no one else that is going to rescue me. There is no other person that has my back right now. It's me, and it's you, and I'm coming to you, and I'm saying, what are you going to do? Many bulls surround me. The strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. They roaring lions that tear apart their prey. They open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax and it has melted within me. He's afraid people, real people with real power are trying to destroy him. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd from all that anxiety. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. It's almost over for me, God. I am done. I am done. I am done. I am poured out. I have no strength left. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. I'm being pursued, he says. They pierce my hands and they pierce my feet and all my bones are on display. He's starving and ripped apart. People stare and they gloat over me. Who is this man? I thought he was God's anointed. Oh, he must be evil. He must have done something wrong. Who is God? You know, all these things. Let him be destroyed or let God save him. We'll see. They're insulting him. They're mocking him. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. He's, he's, been, he's been despoiled. All that he has has been ripped off of him. And he's left naked and bare. But you, Lord, but you, here's the transition, the conjunction, but again. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. When everyone else has turned against me, don't be far from me. You are my strength, so come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. Rich, deep, painful imagery. He was surrounded and was about to be destroyed. And here's his response once again, as it has been throughout this psalm. <laughs> I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. I'm not going to wait for it all to be right. I'm not going to wait until the cows and the lions and the dogs stop pursuing me. I will praise your name today. In the middle of my distress, I will call upon you and lift you up in the, in the assembly before the people. And he then, then he speaks to those who are his. You fear the Lord, praise him. He's telling the, the people of Israel, fear the Lord and praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. 
Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. He's calling the people to praise. His heart has been through the ups and the downs, and he has settled himself that God is God, and he will praise God, whether or not I think he gets delivered. And from that place of total submission and total relinquishment, he cries out to his people to praise, to lift their voices in, rev in reverence before the Lord. For because here's why because he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one sit with those words in the history of his people and even in his own life david recognizes god deserves all of our praise because he never despises us or scorns us in our affliction. He is near. He is near to us. And his love abounds for those who are afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him. He has listened to his cry for help. David says, I am the afflicted one. God's face has been turned towards me. He has listened with his own ears to my cries for help. And he turns his voice back to the God of the universe. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. I will stay faithful to my word towards you. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who are the lowest of the low will have their needs met. God will care for the vulnerable. He will draw the vulnerable to himself. King David, the afflicted one, even in his affliction, says God has drawn me to himself. I know God's heart is for those who are suffering. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. They will have reason to praise, to lift up their voices. May your hearts live forever. May that spirit inside of you live forever, David says to the people. Praise, the heart of praise. May it rise up in you. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all of the families of the nations will bow down before him. What God does for his people will be a sign to those who are not yet his people of who our God is, that he is the God of the afflicted and of the, the less than, of the low ones and those who are in pain. And he will minister to the nations through the suffering of his people. And it will be a sign that all should come and bow down. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. So whether they are for the Lord or against the Lord, they will bow. He will take dominion over the earth because it is his. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. None can escape the judgment seat. None can escape giving an account for our lives. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Well, none of us can really keep ourselves alive for forever. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn. He has done it. David says, I will proclaim now that he has done it. Future generations will see and proclaim that he has done it. Our God has rescued us once again. And that is why uh, these words of Jesus, when he is on the cross and he, he speaks the beginning line of Psalm 22, how powerful of a message is it? We'll turn there now. Matthew, Matthew 27 uh, verse starting in verse 45, you know, just thinking about the movement of, of Psalm 22 on David's lips, 
between his suffering and his, his cries for help and, and feeling so forsaken and lost and abandoned and yet still keeping his eyes on the Lord and, and seeing him high and lifted up and on the throne and fully in power and recognizing the history of who God is and that he has seen God time and again intercede for those who suffer. And these movements of crying out and remembering and giving praise and having hope and recognizing that the Lord has done it, that he has kept his word and that he has and will continue to fight for his. So here we have Jesus on the cross and he's been mocked and everyone's insulting him as he's being crucified. And verse 45 says, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came all over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a, in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words of Psalm 22. And think about it. I have heard so many people make a mess of this passage. Where they say, well, of course, God couldn't uh, be near to Jesus at this time. He turned his back on Jesus because the sins of the world were on his shoulders. I, re I reject. I reject that reading of this passage. Um, I don't think God ever, ever turns his back on any of us, good or bad, suffering or not. God never turned his back on Jesus. This was Jesus reciting a prayer, a prayer that goes on at length beyond, and a prayer that I think Jesus knew. I think Jesus probably knew the entirety of Psalm 22 and knew that though it began with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It didn't end there. It ended with, he has done it. He has rescued me. Even when I was encircled by villains and evil people who were starving me and beating me and insulting me and mocking me, my God has delivered me as he always has and as he always will. He has done it. And this was Jesus' prayer in the midst of the darkest hour as he's about to give up his life. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But yet... I will praise you, but I know that you will deliver, you will do it. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, oh, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Very similar, actually, to what was going on in, in Psalm 22, where David is saying, you know, everybody scorns me and says, let God rescue him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks split and the tombs bro broke open and the bodies of many pe holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus, Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So things are happening, even in this moment where all is dark and seems lost and forsaken. The power of God is rippling through, is working behind the scenes, and is causing a stir. When the centurion and those who with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. He has done it. From my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To he has done it. And we know where this story goes. We know that it leads towards the resurrection and the restoration of all things. My friends, if you sit today feeling forsaken, go to Psalm 22 and find yourself there. Fill in your own words of forsakenness, of anxiety, of fear, of, of the your mouth being so dry from, from panic that the roof of your, that your tongue sticks to the roof of your mouth. Say it all. Proclaim it all. Call everyone out in your prayers who is surrounding you, ready to devour you. But don't leave out the buts. 
But my God is king. But my God sits on the throne. But my God has rescued me before. He's rescued my mother. He's rescued my sister. He's rescued my people. He rescued the Israelites. You recite and repeat those words of rescue until your heart believes it. And you hang on with everything you've got. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But yet I will praise you. For you are the one that the nations will proclaim. See, he has done it. Our God turns things around when we least expect it. When we can't see the way forward, he makes the way. Let him make your way today and have hope. The song that Joe and I sing next is Great is Thy Faithfulness. A song that has endured for the ages because so many have known and seen, experienced, and even longed for the faithfulness of God. And there's one line in particular that continues to stir me today. In the third verse, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Hang on today. God will give you the strength and he will give you bright hope for tomorrow. Be well, friends. Experience God's love and receive my love too. Thank mm-hmm. you.